I'd like to call the uh, January 7, 2014 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission, our first meeting of the new year, to order. And if you will join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, we will start there. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Then if uh, you'll join me in prayer. As we enter this new year, help us to stop and appreciate all our blessings, friends, assets, and opportunities. So much of the world only has a fraction of the quality of life all of us enjoy here in Buncombe County. We're thankful for what we have, but need to be reminded of how bountiful our life is. We ask you to give hope to those who feel hopeless love to those who feel hate, health to those who are sick, relief to those who are overwhelmed, and comfort and support for the people that feel alone. Help our commission to continue our efforts to be thoughtful, caring, optimistic, willing to work with other governments and agencies, be open to new ideas and community messages, and to give our best effort every single day. Help us make 2014 the best year for the people of Buncombe County. Amen. Amen. In accordance with our code of ethics adopted by the commission, it's the duty of every commissioner to avoid both actual and possible conflicts of interest. Does any board member know of any matter on our agenda that may create a conflict of interest? Uh, mm. Chairman Gant, <clears throat> I did want to I did want to point out one item. Um, the zoning tax amendment on the public and private utilities and energy generation facilities. Uh, I am an employee of a company that builds and operates renewable energy projects. I did confer with our attorney earlier today to inquire if that creates a conflict of interest, and uh, he indicated that it did not. And under our as I understand it, because the policy applies broadly to any individuals or businesses that might fall under these rules not to any one particular company it's not a conflict of interest and therefore I should be required to vote on this matter but I just wanted to flag that since I do work for a local company that's involved in that and just see if there were any questions or if if I've captured that correctly Mr. Deutsch thank you, thank you. okay thank you the the law is very clear that commissioners have to vote on things um, unless there's a direct financial gain and there's some other qualifications, but I think that um, I, I would certainly agree and, and thank you for checking that, you gentlemen. Okay. All right. Any other possible conflicts of interest? All right, then we'll start off with public comment. The time limit for any comment to the board is three minutes. If your time expires and you can leave any message along with your name, address, phone number, and email, with the county manager. Commissioners are not expected uh, to comment on any matters during public comment. This is your time to talk to us. Comments should be limited to subjects that are within our jurisdiction or to pe pertain to matters upon which we may act. Any individual speaking during public comment shall address the entire commission. Any polling of commissioners is inappropriate. Person addressing the commission are expected to observe the decorum of the chamber and to be respectful of everyone in the room. Any person who willfully interrupts, disturbs, or disrupts the session will be asked to leave the meeting. And our board reserves the right to deny public address on any subject previously presented and considered by the board. So is there any public comment tonight? Yes, ma'am, second row, pink shirt next. If you'll go up and just uh, give your name and where you live. My name is Laura Cruiser, and I'm a long-term resident of Old Farm School Road. And I'm here today to ask you all if you would please defer any action regarding the old Coggins Farm development off of Old Farm School Road. As a community, we simply have not had enough time to be organized and respond to that proposed development. We have held one community meeting, and we have plans for several more. 
We need more time to explore viable alternatives to this development, several of which have been raised. We also need more time to research the impacts this development would have on our community. I know that I speak for many members of our community when I ask you to please delay any decisions regarding the Coggins property. Thank you. Ms. Cruiser, that is not before our board tonight, so we can do that. Planning board. With I would guess it's with the commissioner's office. I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but she said that um, she was ninety nine point nine percent sure that it would come before the board at the February meeting. Okay, so I see. Ask for a delay beyond that February. Okay, we have not set the agenda at this point, but but we will certainly take that advisement. Thank you for being here, Miss Cruiser. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. In the pink. Anybody who wants to speak after her? Mr. Rice will be next, and then the gentleman in the white will be after Mr. Rice. First of all, I'd like to thank the County Commission for apparently having taken action in the past to Can we get your, I'm sorry, what's your name and where oh, you I'm live? I'm sorry, my That's name is okay. Jeannie Rosenthal. Thank you, Ms. Rosenthal. I live Rosenthal. in the 28801 uh, area downtown. Okay. And I'd like to thank the Commission for having taken action in the past, apparently, to make sure that the so-called electronic cigarettes that are becoming so popular today are counted the same as the traditional dry leaf tobacco uh, cigarettes. Uh, they're, they're harmful. They produce, of course, they, they contain nicotine. Nicotine is very harmful both to the smoker and to the persons in the vicinity where that gas is being expelled from by that person. Uh, my understanding is that the Buncombe County Environmental Health Department has acknowledged that the FDA says that in the uh, electronic cigarettes they have found both carcinogens and toxins. And it's, it's been a real big help that at least Buncombe County, like other places in Asheville, including the VA Medical Center, which is very strong on this issue, does count the electronic cigarettes in this way. Um, what we need to do, though, I believe, is to be even more proactive to find creative ways to getting that message across. Uh, recently, there was an ad playing on a local radio station telling people that they don't smell, and they definitely do smell if you ever stood next to someone smoking one of these things, and also telling people in this radio ad that you can smoke them anywhere, and that's definitely not true. Like I mentioned, the VA Medical Center, for one, um, Buncombe County property, and so on. Uh, there are signs out signs saying um, tobacco use pro prohibited. These companies that sell these contraptions try to get around that by saying that there's no tobacco in there, but where do they get the nicotine from? I would guess they're getting them from, nic from tobacco. Um, and there's other signs that say no smoking or smoke free, and then they get around that by saying, oh, it's not smoking, it's vaping. Well, they can make up any words they want, but it's still harmful. And uh, for example, even at the library, um, they're very proactive with the security guards trying to make sure that no one smokes, even on the red brick portion of the property outside, much less inside. But then apparently people are being told that, you know, by their buddies and stuff that they can go into the bathrooms and do their thing. And then, of course, it gets into the, into the uh, system and goes through the whole building, through the ventilation system. So if we can put posters up in the bathrooms, um, something to let them know, or do PSAs on the radio and, and in television, something to let people know that these are counted the same, and if, if, if regular dry leaf tobacco is prohibited, then these contraptions are prohibited for the health of the public as well. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Rosenthal, just so you're, for your information, Buncombe County was actually the first county in the state to ban tobacco products in our whole property. So we jumped on that within days of the General Assembly giving us permission Excellent. to do so. Thank you. Mr. Rice and then the gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Welcome to a new year. We're out of that 13 now. We ought to get down to some good business. Hope you all had a good holiday. I did. Uh, this would be a good day to talk about global warming, wouldn't it? But we are not going to talk about it. Uh, there's several things that I'd like to bring to your attention. One of them is on the family care homes. If you remember back a few years ago that the state hospitals was the drop in the uh, hospital numbers down and they were 
later showing up in the family care homes and it become a very significant problem and still is. But they changed the law and some things have begun to work the other direction. So now I'm going to bring you something else that I see as a red flag. It's a glaring. And this is on nursing homes. I just had a brother this uh, holiday end up in one the first time. And uh, very sad situation what I saw. I'm familiar with family care, but nursing home is something different. And what I see coming is after the hospital stay for a period of time, uh, I'm seeing the hospital discharging patients very quickly. And a lot of them are going into nursing homes that don't need to be in the nursing home. They need to be in the hospital. And I see this as a trend, and I've been very hard at work talking. And I'm talking to some very important people, and I know that you don't regulate nursing homes, but the state does. And what I bring to your attention is when you look at neglect and you look at adult protective service, uh, you need to be a look in at those issues related to nursing home as well. Because, uh, Mr. Gant, you know health care pretty good. And we're living in a very big population of people that's ending up in these type situations. And we saw the 10 bed thing come on for the homeless, which is a good thing. But I think with this Affordable Care Act, we're even going to see more. And uh, I'm just trying to red flag this thing really quick uh, because I, I see a significant problem. And I'll, I'll bring in some other things later, but certainly I think we need to be ahead of the curve on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Yes, sir. Anyone else want to speak after this gentleman? Anybody else? Hello, my name's Kevin Mathis, and uh, I work for Asheville Elevator Company. I actually own Asheville Elevator Company, and I wanted to share a concern that I have uh, with you guys of something that I've been uh, seeing concerning the elevators and the elevator service in Buncombe County. We, uh, uh, my father started our business in 1957, and I was born here, and we've we've just been, you know, I'm a lifetime resident here, and we've We've been installing uh, elevators here in Western North Carolina for 57 years now and have, have enjoyed a, a long, wonderful relationship with the county as well as the city and uh, have installed mo most of the elevators uh, through the years that have been installed in the, in the newer buildings. And, and, uh, but more recently, it seems like there's been just a, a bit of a disturbing uh, trend that's, that's really just starting to get to me uh, because um, we have been finding that uh, the maintenance contracts that we have with the county have just kind of been uh, disappearing. It's like they're not being rebid. They're just kind of being taken away and given to a uh, worldwide uh, company that uh, is in competition with us. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're all for competition, but we, we feel that with public money that things should be bid and we ought to have the opportunity to not just be left out of uh, business that is the county's business and not uh, for business just not to be taken away, you know, without an opportunity to bid. And uh, so more recently, you know, we like um, today, we uh, had a bid opening for the Asheville Buncombe Technical College job that is coming up out there. And uh, we, you know, the bids were open and we were the low bidder. And uh, so we were excited about that, of course. And, uh, but the statement was made there at the meeting that was quite disturbing that, uh, that we would have to see, you know, we're not sure if we're gonna be able to give you this job because Otis Elevator is the preferred vendor of Buncombe County. And I'll just have to say that's hard. I mean, that's hard being a native and having dedicated, you know, you know, my total career to this area. 
uh, it's hard to hear, and I don't know how Otis Elevator got to be the preferred vendor of Buncombe County, but but I I would just like to say if there if there's ever an opportunity that you guys wanted to say you like local businesses, uh, that I guess it would be a good thing to to look at maybe evaluating that. Mr. Masters, hey. thank you. You called. I think someone from your office called. Uh, I forwarded yes. that. We're going to get you a response. That is a very disturbing yeah. uh, statement to all of us. Absolutely. We do not have a preferred. We are dedicated to bidding things out, and we will find out. We'll get to the bottom of that, and we will get back with you. And I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That is not the way this board operates and does business. Thank you, Chairman. Anybody else tonight? Then is there a motion to follow the agenda as we published it, which includes adopting the consent agenda items? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Then a motion by Commissioner King, a second by Commissioner Belcher. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Then we will follow the agenda by a 7 to 0 vote. Uh, good news proclamations. I think Mr. Conrad here from AB Emblem. And Commissioner Fryer, if you'll meet, uh, AB Emblem folks will meet Commissioner Fryer down at the, at the front here. We're mighty proud of you. Excellent article in the paper. We enjoyed reading your successes. And so Mr. Commissioner Fryer will present the plaque to you. It's an honor to do this. I, I got to go to a supper uh, with these gentlemen and the dad and the father-in-law. Fifty years. Uh, come into this town, they found a little area. What's the name of the restaurant was that? Stony Knob. Stony Knob. Dad found his bride there, his mother, and uh, they built the building next door. They've been here for 50 years. They've had up to 400 employees. They are down to about 100 now, but they're like everybody else. They have to look at China and they have to look at Mexico to try to make sure it all works for them. But I'm proud uh, that, that these guys and the dad and the mom uh, have, have taken on everything out here for that long and, and stayed with Buncombe County. So I'm pleased to give them this plaque that basically says to AB Emblem for 50 years of service on behalf of the citizens of Buncombe County, and this board, on occasion of the 50th anniversary, expresses our sincere appreciation to AB Emblem. We are honored to, we're honored to have you as part of our community and proud that you reach all parts of this world with emblems made here in Buncombe County. You have made this community a better place to live and wish another 50 years to you. So, gentlemen, thank you, and you're more than welcome to speak. Thank you very much. Um, we are very, very proud of our heritage here, and I'm sorry my father couldn't be here, but I know he's very, uh, uh, very proud of this moment, and um, we're we're all very proud of what my grandfather built, and and my mom's father. I'm. Um, proud that he built a Stony Knob restaurant because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't be here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's right around the corner. We eat there almost every day. Um, um, this means a lot to us and, and we, um, we take very serious our commitment to, to Buncombe County and, um, and to the jobs that we, um, that we provide. And, um, you know, we're a factory that a text, textile kind of niche business, but we um, we try to be an employer of choice in manufacturing. So we try to uh, we're a very flat organization. And we try to to uh, put ourselves in the shoes of everybody that works for us. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Commissioner. We appreciate you. you. Thank, thank you, you gentlemen. Next, we'll, uh, I'll recognize Josh O'Connor to talk about the Zoning Text Amendment, Public and Private Utilities and Energy Generation Facilities Amendment. Yeah. Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, 
Chairman Gant and members of the Board of Commissioners. Um, I've got a PowerPoint presentation that I want to start the conversation off with uh, so we can tell you a little bit more about this ordinance. <coughs> Okay, the first point that I uh, would like to make is that under today's ordinance, public utilities are, are not adequately defined. If you look through the definition section of the zoning ordinance, there is no uh, stated definition for public utilities. Uh, but public utilities are listed under uh, the use table within the zoning ordinance as a conditional use in all residential districts with the exception of Beaver Dam, uh, where they are not allowed, and permitted in all commercial districts. Uh, the proposal that you have before you clarifies the conditions required to site one of these facilities uh, to require that an engineer or other professional address the specific public safety aspects embodied by the facility and it also provides a definition of public utilities, private utilities um, and fleshes that concept out a little bit more. Uh, with respect to public utilities, this is not a new regulation. Um, it's an additional modification to an existing regulation um, and it's an attempt to ensure we're doing our part to create accessible rules that account for the associated impact of these facilities. Um, the commissioners will recall the land use plan uh, approved by the commissioners in September of last year actually calls for these proposed changes to ensure that we address utilities and infrastructure as a land use issue. Uh, the impetus for this ordinance came from citizen reaction uh, stemming from a previous proposal in the eastern section of the county um, and that's been ongoing since January 2013 when we've been addressing these issues. Uh, just to move through some of the uh, justifications, um, as I mentioned it was addressed in the land use plan under the connectivity element of section 6 um, and there were specific issues and recommendations brought forward regarding utilities and public utilities. Uh, as we move forward with the land use plan, uh, we received a number of requests to address utilities at a variety of scales. Most of these requests dealt with the inadequacy of the definition of public utilities and the ambiguities associated with the ordinance as it stands today. Uh, staff also received application for a number of private utilities at a scale that generated substantial impact on neighboring properties uh, and potential public safety uh, complications and considerations that we didn't have a means to handle. Uh, what you have up on the, the screen there is just uh, the, the direct uh, copy and paste from the land use plan. Um, but the important part is the land use plan states as an issue that while both public utilities and energy generation facilities are a necessity, there should also be efforts to ensure that these facilities are well maintained and that neighboring property owners have reasonable safeguards put into place. Uh, this section, as I said, is straight from the land use plan and it acknowledges that Utilities and energy are a vital part of Buncombe County's operation, but we also want to ensure that we have a process in place that protects the livelihoods and investments of our citizens. <coughs> Additionally, under the recommendation in the land use plan, um, it states that the zoning ordinance should be modified in a manner that, that separates public utility stations and energy generation facilities according to their impact on the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, I'll reiterate that this is direct codification of the language in the land use plan. So if you read the land use plan, what we've put into the zoning ordinance um, mirrors exactly uh, what was under discussion when the, the planning board and the board of commissioners first saw the land use plan um, and what was under public discussion as well. Uh, just to get into definitions regarding um, public utilities and the, the, the direct languages uh, have, has been available um, on the website, so I don't want to beleaguer that. But the designation between public and private essentially deals with the concept of whether or not the utility in question provides service only to the facility on which it's located, um, such as a solar panel ar array intended to supplement power for a business, uh, rooftop array, or if it interfaces with the wider utility network, um, a solar farm that sells back to the grid, or a pumping station that, that pumps uh, water or, or wastewater. The proposal acknowledges that even private facilities can have a community impact uh, depending on their size. And, and just to summarize, uh, public provides for a larger power for a larger population um, off of the property in which it's located, and private serves the facility on which it's located. Uh, some of the key, nuts, key elements in a nutshell is this ordinance provides a, a form definition of public and private utilities. It sets thresholds regarding the size of facilities and the, and the level of review uh, which will be undertaken. 
Uh, it differentiates on several levels, including residential and commercial districts, and it also accounts for the county's uh, existing protections for protected ridges uh, and steep slope high elevation areas. Um, it adds conditional use standards for those facilities which would have a, a substantial neighborhood impact, and I'll get to those in just one second. Um, I'll also add that there are already a number of protections uh, within other county ordinances that, that this ordinate, ordinance will complement, um, such as the existing stormwater and erosion control ordinances, which, which dictate how runoff and erosion control from the development of these sites um, is taken care of. So into the meat of the uh, proposal, as part of the approval process for utility stations, uh, the applicant must pre present information showing that they have addressed the key conditions to public safety uh, and protection of property values. And you have some of those conditions there, um, which are straight out of the ordinance. The conditional use process, uh, <laughs> where we see approval of that, is not a subjective process which allows the county to reject applications that are politically unfavorable. Um, instead, it's a, a very controlled quasi-judicial process that ask an applicant to submit evidence showing that they meet the standards of the ordinance. From a broad legal overview, the Board of Adjustment weighs that evidence and grants approval when the evidence demonstrates that the ordinance standard is met. Uh, the Board of Adjustment is required to act on evidence and fact, and there are legal protections in place if the applicant feels that their decision extended beyond that framework. So if the Board of Adjustment uh, were to make something that the applicant felt that uh, was arbitrary, they already have protections in place to pursue um, that and get a fair decision. The Board of Adjustment meeting also serves as a notice to the public regarding construction of new facilities and provides them an opportunity to interface with staff and better understand the pertinent rules. Uh, in closing, I just want to say that the intent of this ordinance is, to not, is not to deny uh, utility service to any county resident. Uh, staff has worked to ensure that we treat all utility types equally. Uh, we didn't want to create a set of rules that impose protections on renewable and emerging technology uh, while ignoring the impacts and implications of traditional infrastructure. The proposal before you tonight, again, mirrors the language that you've already approved in the land use plan, and it ensures that we're working to protect Buncombe County citizens. The ordinance ensures that the controls we have in place reflect the unique conditions found within Buncombe County's topography and ensures that projects are designed to fit the needs of our citizens and natural environment. And with that, I can take any questions that the board may have. Okay, let any commissioner have questions before we start our public hearing? I've, I've got a couple, uh, yes, Josh. Um, just one, just for the, for the folks that are here uh, and, and listening, could you explain uh, what a conditional use is? And sure. Why, in, the, in the documents that's in there, there's, there's these tables that have a C and they have a P and C's for conditional and P's for permitting, I think. And so could you just explain to everybody, that, number one, the, the, the definition of that, please? Sure. So the use table does have a P for permitted, and that means you would just submit your normal building permit, um, and it would be a staff level review. Conditional are those uses that um, may have a higher level of community impact or may require more than one set of eyes. So you submit a packet of information uh, and it's broken down um, in the ordinance as to what's needed, usually site development plans and in this case uh, you'd be asked to submit some specific information showing that the utility that you're proposing didn't interfere with aviation, didn't interfere with existing roadways, things of that nature. And you submit it to the Board of Adjustment. Um, you go before the Board of Adjustment, the Board of Adjustment reviews that information um, and also takes public comment. The public comment is a little bit more constrained than uh, what we find here at the, the commissioners meeting in that it's restricted to evidence so if somebody wanted to rebut what the applicant presented um, it it would be required to come from some type of professional who was required who was able to make that determination okay so does that answer your question yeah that's excellent so and secondly uh, could you explain uh, what decommissioning me. Sure. Uh, the ordinance does have a provision uh, for decommissioning, um, and what we're speaking of when we say decommissioning is if the facility were to stop operation, um, whether it was abandoned, uh, whether it was no longer uh, economically feasible, um, we've asked that there be some provision to take that facility apart, uh, to make sure that um, it didn't stop operation and stay there stagnant for the next 50 years. Uh, the ordinance is somewhat open because there are several different mechanisms um, that could be shown to the Board of Adjustment uh, to show that they have a decommissioning fund available, uh, one of which might be a typical bond or surety 
where they've they've shown how much it would cost to do that they go to a bank or a bond provider to get that um, and we know that that money's there uh, for a larger entity that that has a larger line of credit uh, they could show the board um, how much money they have in reserve to take care of that type of of issue thank you josh no problem uh, so i would like for you to clarify too that this won't impact directly right of ways uh, that also that what we're doing won't override any state uh, controls and uh, for example the state utilities commission we can't do anything that that uh, hampers them and uh, I guess basically I, I'd like to say the public, this was brought about when it was asked for because of a situation that came about at, in the eastern part of the county at Ridgecrest earlier or last year. And uh, so the concern was uh, a, a lot of concerns about how these things would be implemented, not traditional power, not traditional utilities. But uh, and the intent is not to prevent them, it's to make sure we uh, have them regulated and, and the citizens of Buncombe County and, and our county is not negatively impacted and that there is uh, some means in place if they are abandoned to uh, make sure they're taken care of. Sure. With respect to right-of-ways, um, that's always been a, a hands-off <coughs> situation for us. Um, it's, it's typically considered outside of, of our, our zoned area and our land use area. Um, with facilities uh, that are placed in uh, the role of the Utilities Commission, um, they do have some jurisdictional overview so that if, if one of our ordinance components somehow had the, the impact that would prevent that utility from providing service to an area or a group of residents, uh, the Utilities Commission can step in at, at that point and ensure that that service is available. Okay. And just like to clarify, this does not affect individuals if, if they want to put panels or whatever on their, their roof, their home, th this, this only affects those that would fall under a utility uh, definition. Sure. Um, with respect to individuals, um, a, a residential solar application, <coughs> we're, that's already hands off for us because of state general statutes. Um, because of the size of it, it wouldn't be impacted by this, this ordinance anyway. Um, when we, we look at those, um, we've also made provisions for things like shared septic and shared wells that are shared <coughs> between um, one or two property owners to make sure that we didn't step across that line. Thank you. No Josh, tell us about the two acre threshold, how that fits in, where that fits in. Sure. Let me just flip to that section. So private utility stations, and to give an example, that might be a water tower that you have in your subdivision um, to, to enable you to have better water pressure, um, or a, a package treatment plant. Those, if they are less than two acres, are allowed by right in all districts. Um, those same private utility stations, say if you were building a solar array um, that was intended to serve your campus, um, once you, you hit a two acre threshold, those become a conditional use and you have to, to demonstrate that you've accounted for those issues. Um, public utilities less than two acres remain like they are in the, uh, the zoning ordinance today. Um, they're conditional in all the residential districts, so if it's going to be next to houses, we want to have that higher level of review and permitted in all the, uh, the commercially oriented districts. Uh, once they exceed two acres in footprint, uh, they again become conditional in all the districts. Um, if the project falls within either the steep slope or protected ridge overlays, uh, because of the sensitivity of those areas uh, from a, a topographic standpoint as well as the impact on the view shed, uh, those are conditional across the board for both private and public. In conditional, you basically have to tell people what you're doing. Go to the Board of Adjustment and have everybody hear what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. And so there's no question about it. And you can still do these things, whether you're public or private. It's just for some, we're, we're stepping it up for some of the bigger farms, uh, the ones that sell. The key is selling back to the utility or the utility using it to make money as opposed to an individual powering their house, unless it exceeds two acres. Sure. Is that right? Is that kind of the nutshell? Sure. With a conditional use, if the, if the applicant has provided what's asked for in the ordinance, uh, the Board of Adjustment does not have a lot of license to deny the application. 
Um, it also creates a, a more voluminous public record. So um, we know exactly what was said. Uh, we know what was proposed. Um, and the public's aware of that. So if, if something is done outside of, of that approval, then, then everybody has a record to go back to and say, hey, this is not what was approved. We need to adjust it back to what was approved. And then if the bottom falls out, like Commissioner Belcher asked, you know, we have a way th to mon monetarily take it down and remove it if it's abandoned instead of just let it sit there and rust and rot or whatever it does. If, if we don't have a way to monetarily do it through a surety directly, uh, then we have a great level of confidence that the money is available to make sure that that's done through another source. Because that's one of the things, and I think you and I talked about, I won't get off on this too much, but with subdivisions, you know, like Black Oak, you know, a way to make sure that the people that buy into these subdivisions or any kind of development, whatever it is, we have a way to protect them if things go south and people can't finish what they're doing. There's some way they have a remedy besides just hoping. And um, so I really appreciate you working on that. And good question uh, from Commissioner Belcher, too. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I. Anybody else? Any other ones? All right. Thank you. We'll start our public hearing. Uh, we'll have the same rules, three minutes. Anybody that wishes to be heard, we'll be, we want to hear from you. Um, I'll declare the public hearing start at 512. Any members of the public want to be heard on this ordinance amending our uh, zoning ordinance about the public and private utility issue? Mr. Rice? Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. You'll be after Mr. Rice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of money <clears throat> on buying up tracts of land. I mean, millions of dollars a year, a couple million. And it's all about looking from the parkway and what a beautiful scene we have down in the valley. But now we talk about the view shed. I just heard mentioned real lightly here. What does it look like over at Biltmore Farms over here when you see all them things spread out on the side of the interstate? They ain't too beautiful, are they? Well, let me bring something to light. If we're a tourist town and we're looking at business and everything to be attract tourists, we need to be looking at the utilities that the power company is running because every time I pull my camera up to take a beautiful picture of sunset, I get these lines in my picture, power lines. Not only that, if we look at what we're doing today on this ordinance, we're going to have farms coming out everywhere. You ain't going to necessarily see them from the parkway, but what an unsightly scene we're going to see in their neighborhoods. And to me, it might be a profit for a few, but if you're going to be consistent with the view from a parkway, what do you want the visitor to see when they come? A bunch of solar, solar panels, if I can say that word. So we need to be thinking about business, of course. But let's look at the visitors it's coming to. Because if we're going to be consistent, let's, let's maintain it down here where we have to come and, and, and live. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back, black. Brown. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Mary Standard, and I live in the town of Montreat, North Carolina, District 2. Last January, Mrs. Joyce Hughes of Ridgecrest and I stood before the commissioners voicing concern about the 200-acre, 90,000-panel <clears throat> solar farm planned by a company from New Mexico for the Lifeway Ridgecrest Conference Center in the eastern part of the county. Articles in the Asheville Citizen Time reported that this company had applied for the needed certification from the Public Utilities Commission and construction was slated to begin that very spring. Upon inquiry, we were surprised to learn that no one in the county government had been contacted by this company. Not a single engineering dollar had been spent to determine the suitability of the site, and no plans were in place to determine just what would happen to these 90,000 panels at the end of the useful life, 
would they become just a junkyard to be removed by the taxpayers of Buncombe County? Even more astounding was the fact that no one from this company in New Mexico had ever even set foot on this heavily forested property. Mrs. Hughes organized a petition gathering several hundred signatures, largely from District 2, which questioned the appropriateness of this massive solar farm. She is working tonight and could not attend. The commissioners listened to these concerned and acted. In March of last year, the company withdrew its application following discussions with county staff and officials. Tonight, I ask for your support of the Public Utilities Amendment. These amendments will not th prevent the growth of large-scale renewable energy projects such as low solar farms, but will ensure that proper site selection and engineering studies are in place before large-scale projects are initiated by any entity, either a public utility or a private company, and that plans are in place to finance the removal of such installations if the project is shut down <coughs> for any reason. The proposed amendments were unanimously supported by the Buncombe County Planning Board. I urge you to vote into the affirmative tonight. The process has been ongoing for more than a year, and without its enactment, a Ridgecrest-type project could happen tomorrow. Each time I see the roads cut above the slopes along the Swannanoa River in the stalled High Carolina Cliffs development, I am saddened and reminded that the timing of the vote is critical to protect that which we cherish. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for your leadership. Any other comments tonight? If not, I'll declare the public hearing closed at 519. Uh, comments, questions from the commission? Comment. <laughs> Commissioner Farr? Uh, Ms. Standridge, I, uh, I had the pleasure to meet with the people from Ridgecrest about a year ago on this when I first became a commissioner. We, we didn't do a whole lot in District 2. We tried hard, and then Josh got in, and I learned uh, quite a bit about it. But uh, we have to give all of this to the people at Ridgecrest and the Black Mountain area that it's basically Ridgecrest that, that put the 90 acres forward and, and helped get it killed probably parts of this that I probably don't like but 90 percent of it I do like and uh, you know that's where I'll probably be on it uh, I think there's tweaks that can be done as we go along I think uh, Josh the and Creighton what there's areas that we can look at as as it passes through I hope uh, but uh, all in all the two acres that sounds like a, a plenty and uh, utilities, we know they're going to do what they have to do. So I will, I'll follow along on this one, but I do appreciate it. Any other comments? I'll make a motion to um, adopt this ordinance amending the text of uh, Chapter 78. Uh, I am sorry I didn't have my microphone on, so sorry Commissioner, about that. Commissioner Jones, can I make a comment before you of make course. your motion? Uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Josh and, and John uh, for their uh, d diligence in providing what I believe is a sensible solution uh, to a difficult problem in balancing energy, both public and private, with community concerns. So I appreciate that. I would, I would ask that you reach out to the, uh, the public utilities uh, that could not be here tonight, uh, and obviously they would have been here to speak. Uh, that you reach out to them to see if they have any specific concerns or anything that you might be able to address. <clears throat> you would do that. I would appreciate it, and I uh, I intend to support this. Sorry, Chairman. Again, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, so I do. You know, this is um, this is kind of what I do. I work on developing solar <laughs> projects, so <laughs> I think about this stuff a lot, and. Um, but I think, the, um, I think the standards that are set forth in the proposed ordinance are uh, very common sense standards. I think these are the kind of standards that most responsible uh, renewable energy companies would um, naturally hold themselves to uh, anyway. Um, but uh, I think these, these kinds of policies and rules we'll put in place will help 
um, assured that they're adhered to with any project that might be might be contemplated in the community. I think we are going to see. Um, I think we're a community that has very strong support for for clean energy and and, and wants to see more uh, renewable energy and clean energy projects going forward. Um, but there are trade-offs. Um, you know, these kind of projects do require require land, and so I think uh, these kinds of policies um, help put in place a process where we. Um, we will um, we will optimize our our ability to create new sources of clean energy while protecting the beauty and environmental health and public safety of the community uh, as we do so. So I think it's a good step forward. Let me give it another shot. Okay, okay we'll um, take more comments <laughs> after the motion. So. Sorry. Uh, I would move that we adopt this zoning text amendment regarding public and private utilities and inter, uh, energy <coughs> generation facilities. I'll second that. There's been a motion by Commissioner Jones, a second by Vice Chair Frost. Is there any further discussion? I have one question. Um, Josh, is, is this, <coughs> do any other mountain counties have an ordinance? Uh, in place now, and, and how are we? Are there are there, were there many models to go by across the state in general? Um, in terms of mountain counties, I'm not aware of, of any that that have uh, an ordinance in place. Um, at least that that not directly works to uh, govern public utilities, specifically <coughs> solar and renewables. Um, there may be some uh, for wind farms, but um, this is a rapidly developing area. Um, North Carolina State University has led the way um, in developing a model ordinance and, and our process uh, somewhat paralleled their process. We were able to gain information on what they were doing um, as well as look to the school of government in developing what, what we brought forward. They just didn't have anything about steep slopes in Wake County, I presume, or <laughs> no, there was, we have here to worry about. Huh? There was not a lot in the model ordinance that dealt with uh, steep slopes okay. specifically, so we're kind of out on our own there. Well, we're thankful that we had a steep slope ordinance to to stop the Ridgecrest train wreck that was going on, and and I think most would agree the scope and, and scale of that. How many how many acres did you did Mary say that was? Uh, the original proposal was two hundred acres. We didn't have a way to stop that until you got involved and we went through the process. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Belcher. I think it's the hard part of this job is to be pro is to look ahead instead of being reactive to everything and we just kind of dodged the bullet on that one and um, I hope this board I think this board is ready to pass this I, uh, I, I it's always a challenge to not get behind and 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 let some disaster or something happen that nobody agrees is a good idea except for just a few people that profit so um, I appreciate your work. I appreciate all the commissioners gave a lot of input on this. Um, and um, Mary, I, I particularly want to thank you again because you really, um, really brought this to our attention and, and put it on the radar for us. Thank you. Any further comments? Yeah, I just, I mean, I will just add, I do think it's a, it's a beautiful example of, you know, the public and the professionals as well as the elected officials coming forward and saying, here is the way we want to uh, try to solve and get ahead of this problem. So I think it's one of those times where all this is this is how democracy works at its best is when all these voices are are, are heard and um, and we find a way forward. So thanks to all involved. Okay. Any other comments or questions? If not, we'll call the question. All those in favor of the uh, motion by Commissioner Jones, second by Vice Chair Frost, to approve the zoning text amendment as stated, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The amendment is adopted seven to zero. Next, we have uh, economic development uh, incentive for Jacob Holm, and we have John Creighton here to tell us about the incentive and to uh, present the resolution. This will also be a public hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, an expansion, very good news, for local industry. Uh, Jacob Holmes. Just to give you a little sense of history, uh, their their national or their international headquarters is in, in Switzerland. They have two other plants. One is located in France. Another one is located here in Buncombe County. They are one of the largest producers of non-woven fabric in the world. Uh, back in 2005, we were very fortunate to recruit them here to Buncombe County. 
Uh, currently, they employ 82 uh, people. So several months ago, I was approached by Tim Lampkin at the, at the Chamber of Commerce uh, Economic Development Arm with a possible expansion of, of Jacob Homes. <coughs> um, he told me at that time that we had competition, that they were looking at an, possibly another state, even another, another country, or expanding here in Buncombe County. The, uh, the proposal was the, they were going to invest $46 million, hire additional 66 employees, uh, which would happen over the next two years, uh, with the average wage of $46,258. And that's fairly substantial when you look at the average wage of Buncombe County is $36,348. So it's basically $10,000 above the average wage here in the county. Uh, <clears throat> the commissioners, at the, we came upon, a, or, or I went to the commissioners, uh, with a proposal for an incentive of $1,120,545 that would be payable over five years. And I'm happy to say that Jacob Holmes has taken us up on the offer and they are willing to expand the plant here in Buncombe County. So I'd just like to go through and show you a couple slides on our investment and what that return on the investment uh, will be. Uh, Max. When you look at the $1.1 million investment, uh, over the five years, you have in the blue column at the, at the bottom $15,276,520. That is a, a direct effect or a direct return. That, that is the wages, the 66 jobs times the 46258 over five years will return over $15 million into our, into our economy and will employ 66 people. When you look at the indirect uh, investment that will happen of the, is the red in the column there. It's $5,481,486. Is that, is, you say Jacob Holmes is all of a sudden they've got an extra 50,000 square feet of, of space. Somebody's got to clean that. There's additional employees, so there's going to be extra copy paper. It's going to be extra delivery to the plant. So <clears throat> that in turn creates more in jobs being all of, sudden, all of a sudden the janitorial services, but we need to hire an extra person. Or the delivery company has to hire another person. Or, you know, there's jobs created just through the company expanding itself. And then you have the induced uh, amount of $4,870,000. $8,917 is all of a sudden now I'm empl employed by Jacob Holmes. I have, a, I have a new job. I have a better job. All of a sudden I can go out and take my wife out to eat on Friday night. All of a sudden the restaurant says, you know, business is picked up. Maybe we need another waiter. Or all of a sudden the gas station is saying, okay, we're having more business. Or Ingalls Market saying, you know, we're selling more groceries. So it rolls through the economy there. And then you, and finally, you've got the, uh, the local taxes of $4.5 million. That's, that's property tax. That's fire tax. Uh, that's sales tax. That's license fees. That's all sorts of fees that go through the economy also. So when you look at our $1.1 million investment, and uh, you're close to $30 million that it generates over, over uh, the five-year period. So... Not only is that we've got a $30 million return, we've also got additional people working here. We've saved our jobs from going some other state or even some other country. So I really want to commend you all for s stepping up and, and, ha and having Jacob Holmes expand here. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, the vice president plant manager is here is Jeff Sellers, and I would like to ask him to come up and say a few words about their expansion. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeff Sellers, and I'm the Vice President of Operations for Jacob Home Industries. Take a couple of minutes to just tell you about our company, what we do, um, where we come from, and what our project will look like. 
we're an old company. We were formed in Denmark back 220 years ago. Original owner obviously is no longer with us. Um, we were we were purchased by a man by the name of Phil uh, Paul Mickelson back in 1979, and he's owned the company ever since. He's uh, committed to North Carolina. Obviously, he developed the plant here in 2005, and when it was developed, then it was the, the fastest, widest, non-woven spun lace manufacturer in the world. So he's proud of that. It, it brought a lot of economic development to, to Candler and obviously to Jacob Home as well. So it's been a, a very mutual, mutually uh, beneficial relationship. So we're, we're very excited about moving forward. Um, the product that we produce right now, uh, we do non-woven materials. And I, somebody asked earlier, what the heck is non-wovens? Traditional textile manufacturing uses a loom, takes threads and they get woven together. Non-woven manufacturing is the bonding of fibers using either heat, water, chemical bonding or something like that. We, we actually use high pressure water jets and that, that ties our material together. And the products that we make are baby wipes or, or, or wet wipes. So it's, we're mm -hmm. the, the roll manufacturer that gets, that we produce rolls and they get con sent to a converter, puts them in a package and they'll, you can buy them at your, at your local big box store. Um, the project that we're talking about is patented technology. Um, so it's going to be something that's pretty beneficial or pretty complementary to what we're currently doing. But it's, uh, it's, it's a new technology. So we're tying together some existing technologies that, that currently are not married. Um, so it'll be something that only we can do. Um, as John was stating, we're going to invest a minimum of $45 million, 66 jobs over the next two years at that $46,000 a year rate. So we're excited about that. Um, and our plan right now is to, to start the civil engineering work in February. So we hope to be moving dirt on our site over in, on Sand Hill Road in Candler in February. Construction in April through au the August time period. Um, equipment installation July through December with actual startup of equipment in January. So a year from now we hope to be testing our equipment and getting ready to, to kick off the manufacturing process. So again, thank you very much for your support. We're excited to be in Western North Carolina and uh, Hope to be around here for a long time. May I answer any questions for you? Any questions, Mr. Did you get any help from the state of North Carolina? Oh, we did, actually. Right. We, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Self. Any other any comments before we open our public hearing on uh, the uh, I'd I'd like to make a quick comment. Yes, sir. I'd like to uh thank Mr. Sellers and uh Jacob Holm for their investment here. Uh I, I think this is uh, wonderful. The, the return on this for Jacob Home and for Buncombe County is uh, it's a, a great thing. And uh, also, as representative of District 3, which Candler is in, uh, we're very excited about the expansion out there. And um, was fortunate enough to be out, out at the uh, plant not long ago. And it, it's just a beautiful facility that adds a great deal to our community. Uh, obviously, the employees there have great pride in what they do, and uh, I'm just very thankful to you for uh, being here and being a member of our community. Thank you so much. Chairman Gann, also I'd like to echo uh, Commissioner King's excitement about the Candler area and uh, what that means to the people that are there. And, and as my understanding, this is basically doubling uh, your line. Uh, and that's a big deal. When you double the size of a, of a manufacturer, that's something that we, we should all get very excited about and the revenue that can come in from that. But it's within about a quarter of a mile from a new school. There'll be some five and six year olds, that, um, not five and six year olds, but fifth and sixth graders that'll be over there and, uh, and uh, maybe they'll be training, and maybe they'll have an opportunity to work for Jacob Holmes. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of forward thinking the things that, that gets me pretty excited. So. Uh, I'm, I'm um, also very supportive of this this evening. Thank you. Any other comments? I, I actually had a couple of quick questions. questions. Um, John, I'm going to ask one of my favorite questions to ask you, mm -hmm. which is um, because the other piece of that you could put in your graph there has to do with the jobs that could be created around the the, con the construction, this moving dirt that's going to happen, because that's going to put people to work too, and we we know that our our construction sector has taken a big hit. It's coming back, but this is going to be a nice, a nice shot in the arm. Any idea of that that job impact uh, for the for the project that's being proposed? What we're talking about in terms of um, jobs? No, but I would I would think that you'd put you know you'd you'd have a at least over a hundred people working in the construction part of it. I mean it's it's 
it's a good size expansion. I mean, when you look at just the direct and indirect uh, jobs there, there's 123 jobs that just filter down through the, through the economy from the 66. So if you talk about the construction part of it, I think you'd, you'd have at least 100 people. I mean, you, you've got the finishers, concrete finishers, you've got the people that are laying the block, uh, painting the walls, the electricians, the plumbers, the HVAC people. Yeah. So. I think that's really important and I think it's important for us to highlight as, as construction is happening again and coming up that that is not only are we going to get these jobs you know for for the long run we're going to have these sh these short term uh, people people getting getting a paycheck too so exactly. it's exciting. I agree. What is the current investment of Jacob, Jacob Holmes in our tax base? Uh, the original investment was 40 million now um, you know that's that's what they're original from 2005 it was 40 so okay was. okay that's so, great yeah so if you, you know you, you combine them together you're reaching on up towards 100 million dollars gotcha thank you J uh, one other question do you have any and if you can't answer this it's fine because it's kind of putting you on the spot but the uh, four and a half million dollars do you know is say half of that property tax uh, or uh, the investment when you look at the investment I think there's about two hundred a little over two hundred forty thousand dollars is is just is property taxes to Buncombe County annually yes sir um, and so you look at the fire and you know the sales tax from from all the from the 15 million plus that's just the direct so you get the indirect and the induced that's that's a lot of money when you're looking at close to 30 well minus the four four point eight so down to saying $25 million that'll filter through the economy over the next five years. That, that buys a lot of bread and milk. You know. Great. Any other questions or comments before we start the public hearing? I'd like to recognize Mr. Tim Lampkins here. Thank you for being here. I always appreciate the Chambers and the EDC's efforts to put these things together and help us to know what's out there. So thank you for being here, Tim. If not, I'll go ahead and call the public uh, hearing to order. On, I'll, I'll go with uh, 538. Any members of the public wish to be heard on the economic incentive proposal for Jacob Holm? Mr. Rice? Anybody else wish to be heard while Mr. Rice is coming up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We always brag on the folks in Canada, don't we? That's right. The good folks. We need the money. Yeah. We need jobs. Uh, and we certainly appreciate Mr. Holmes and what he does. Uh, but I have a longer term look at this thing. Uh, we talk about sustainability. Sure, you're getting tax money. You're getting revenues from things coming in. But, you know, in our world of human service, we see a high Medicaid, high things that we're looking at in numbers of people that need services in Buncombe County. But when you look at the long term of sustainability, it's in jobs that are created here that's going to sustain a family. Now, what I'm bringing this to your attention for is when you look at the tail lights going out of Asheville and you look at the headlights coming into Asheville, how many of these jobs are actually created that we're talking about for these jobs that we're putting incentive money in? How many of those employees are actually Buncombe County residents? We need to think about that because I think our Medicaid and our food stamps and all these things I think life would be better in Buncombe County if you'd take account on the people that actually lives in Buncombe County uh, that's on these jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rice. Any other public comment tonight? Mr. Chairman, I would just say one thing. That data is available if they wanted to particularly look at the Chamber's website. You can see movement between counties on, on jobs. Thank you. Any other public comment tonight? If not, I'll declare the public comment closed at 541. Uh, 
Is there a motion? And then we'll do discussion. Motion, to, motion to approve the resolution authorizing Buncombe County to pay economic development incentives and to sign an economic development agreement. And a motion by Commissioner Newman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner um, King. Any discussion? Now I'll call the question. All those in favor of the uh, motion to adopt the uh, the resolution on the economic incentives for Jacob Holmes say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Then we have adopted the motion by a seven to zero vote. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Jeff. Next up, we have county manager's report, and we will be hearing about Black Oak. So if we could uh, get uh, Mr. Creighton's coming to the front again. Mr. Chairman, board members, um, the, the chairman asked me to kind of go through tonight about changes that we've had in the ordinance since I guess the, the it's the far subdivision or at the Black Oak subdivision uh, came into effect. I think I'm going to go through and, and talk about the changes that we've made I get over the last 25 years, and then I think the county attorney is going to talk about uh, the problems with with public expenditures uh, to to correct some of the issues there. I think that when you look back, um, just kind of give you a, a sense of history here, the, the, the property was uh, platted back in the late 80s. Uh, the average slope of, of the, the area where the house slid is 38.75% and it sits on 1.54 acres. And like I say, it was, it was planted back in 88, and it was called the forest subdivision. Uh, when you start talking about the zoning ordinance, this is, originally was in Beaver Dam zoning ordinance. Uh, their jurisdiction, and it was, a, it, it was zoned in low density, Beaver Dam low density. Um, the, if you look at the current standards, <coughs> the, it would now, it would, it would end a 37% slope it would, it would call for a three acre lot instead of a 1.5. And I think that anybody who's seen this, this development and this, this lot in particular would agree that the, the lot itself was a lot more than the, uh, the 38% that, that I'm talking about. We put it through the soap calculator. So if the, if the lot was at 40%, which was basically another percent and a quarter, uh, the, the minimum lot size would be five acres. So if, and I think it, it's important to keep in mind that not just this house and this lot would be five acres, but <clears throat> the area up there is all steep, that the surrounding houses would be five acres also. So then you're talking about a lot more acreage, uh, a lot less density, you got a lot less runoff. Uh, there's just a lot of things that when you get dense, you get steep, you get into problems. I think also when you look at that in Beaver Dam, we changed in 2007 to put in density and, uh, I mean, disturbance and impervious uh, regulations. So those would also come into effect. Then you have the steep slope high elevation uh, district, which uh, we created in 2010. That basically affects any property that's over 35% or greater and 2,500 2, feet in elevation which most of this area uh, would come under those, those jurisdictions. Under those standards, uh, you could have 0.3 acres that could be disturbed and 0.16 uh, could be uh, impervious. So, you know, your disturbance would be a lot less, your lot would be a lot, lot larger, and all those surrounding lots and houses would be a lot larger and a lot in, less impervious and, and disturbed area. Then you look at the overlay regulations also, when you look at anything that's over 35%, uh, would require a, a global stabilization study by a geotechnical engineer. So the, the engineer would make res recommendations, and then those recommendations would have to be followed, and the engineer would have to come back 
and submit to us that they were followed before the CO would, would come about and be issued. So <clears throat> there's, there's a number of regulations that just happen when you get in those steep slopes, especially when you get a geotechnical engineer involved, and then all of a sudden you, you've got less density and less impervious surface and a lot larger lot. Then in 94, we started the subdivision uh, regulations. And we did uh, hillside development standards, which also were adopted in 2003, that said that basically anything that over a 25% slope uh, would, it, would come under the development standards and re reduce the collective inf infrastructure and the lot. So all of a sudden, you've got the lot that comes under impervious and disturbed. You've got the road, any kind of infrastructure being stormwater and anything all of a sudden comes under the regulations. Also, when you get into those type of regulations of a 30% slope, which we're more than 30% slope here, you gotta have an engineer involved in, in road design. Also, you've also got to have a geotechnical engineer that's involved in the foundation design and, and the disturbance that's happening on, on the lot. So all these factors start coming into play to try to keep these kind of actions from happening in the future. Um, and about this, since 1988, we've also had erosion control and stormwater standards. Uh, both control cut and fill slopes. Uh, also, in stormwater, you get into uh, regulations as far as infrastructure, especially if you have a large rain, uh, how to handle that rain, and to keep that rain from doing damage. Uh, also, in this case, uh, this, this subdivision is over 11 lots, it's 26 lots, so it would have to come before the planning board for approval and also get st a staff review. So when, when you go through and you look, and it's been you know, over 25 years, there's been a lot of regulations that have come about to try to keep things that have happened up on, on Black Oak from occurring in the future. I can't sit here and say that they never will happen. We could get a, a 10 inch rain this coming summer and would cause a lot of problems. But when you look at the amount of regulations that have come in the factor of the last 25 years, there's a lot of things that, that, that uh, would occur in an old subdivision that wouldn't occur today. So in summary, I wanna look at, we've got ordinances in place We've got engineers doing design. We've got engineers doing sign off, which makes somebody liable uh, for a bad design or, or a bad installation. And I think that you look at what's compared now, and back then you've got a larger parcel, you've got decreased disturbance, and you've got involvement in a, in a geotechnical engineer on the, on the home site design, the foundation design, and also the roads within the subdivision. So I think there's been a lot of things that have taken place that, like I say, that we're trying to ensure that this won't happen in the future. So if you've got any questions as far as what we've done in the past and how it relates to this and, particular problem. As I remember the water ordinance, the um, stormwater, the after you build the same amount, you have to have the same or less amount of water runoff as you did before you started. Yeah, and you building. can't divert that. I mean, you can't take water from, you know, this area and put it over into another area. So that's so, you, you're, so there's about ten different ways this could never happen. This could not happen today. Yeah, but you know, I, I, I agree. There, we have a lot of ordinances, and in this particular case. Uh, I think that when you have, if you'd had an engineer there looking at the foundation, looking at the, what, what was going to happen on the, on the property, you had impervious regulations and disturbance, and you had somebody looking at the road, it's hard to believe that it would have. I can't say that it, it yeah, would not We can't not guarantee it. No. I understand that. I, I just think we've got a moral obligation when people spend a lot of money to build on these top of these mountains. We can't stop it and we don't want to stop it. We want people to feel like they can use their property. I just want to make sure that, number one, we, we do all we can to make sure it's safe. And number two, if something does go wrong, we have a way for the responsible parties to pay to fix it. And you, and you feel like we're there with the 
safeguards in place? Yeah, we do. I think that when we have an engineer design stuff and you have an engineer that, that signs off on it, it does put the liability on whoever did the design and whoever did the building. I think that's an important thing to, to remember. Uh, I, I just, you know, like I say, I think that when you spread things out and when you look at this subdivision, it's compact. I mean, it's very steep. You know, there's a house that slid, there's a house right there, there's a house right there, and on the other side of the road, there's a house right there. You wouldn't see that today. I mean, would, would, would it be fair to say that with everything that's been done, we're putting in the best possible safeguards so it would never happen again, but with weather, with 12 inches of rain, you can't ever say never. Exactly. I, I think, I, I think that we really are trying to ensure that people uh, do the right thing, buy into a, a development that is safe, that won't give them problems down the road. But, you know, Mother Nature sometimes overrides all that, and, you know, it just, it just happens. And there's no control. I mean, you, you try to build for a 25-year storm or a 50-year storm or whatever, but, you know, on a, on a Saturday afternoon in July, all of a sudden you get a storm that comes in or something comes off the Gulf, and something we never anticipated happens. You could wake up in the morning and there'd be a 20 below zero wind chill. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. where did that come from? Yeah. So, uh, or bearing organic material, trees, stumps, things like that, where, where is that protected? You know, I, I, I went to see this site in my, in my past life of over 30 years, I've dealt with, you know, homes being placed in very difficult sites and, uh, that, which that seems to be, uh, that can be a problem in driveways and things like that. And I know the county covers that. I know it's taken care of. I'm just wondering where, how that is, because you know yourself that can be a really big problem with roads and things, is bearing of organic material. That, that one factor right there caused the subdivision regulations to come into effect or come into being. Yeah, it's a big uh, We had a... We had a subdivision that was out in Fairview where they had done exactly the same thing. A, bunch, a number of people had bought in it that were not residents here. They were basically summer residents. And all of a sudden, the road basically started sloughing off simply because of all the, the trees had been pushed over and buried. That's what brought that about. And that's, you know, when you start looking, we really don't see a lot of that problem today. People, because there, there are people involved being engineers, uh, both the design and from the geotechnical side. What we see more today is obviously 25 years later, all the, all the land on the bottom of the, of the valley is, is gone and people start moving up and all of a sudden people like the desire of living up on the side of the mountain looking at a nice view. And we have some spectacular ones around here. And that's where you get into above those 30% slopes where all of a sudden there's no tow or somebody comes in and cuts the tow out wow. and the thing starts moving. Uh, you know, and that's when we really looked at steep slope and high elevations. We really looked at that cut and fill. One is the visual impact that it has on a very steep slope being you chase that cut up half the side of the mountain, but also is a, a way that when you get into a steep, steep slope is to be able to make that fill and be able to tie it into something. And you just, that's why you just can't continuously go up a steep slope forever and a day because at some point you're going to run into trouble. John, have we, um, <clears throat> have we looked at or seriously studied the, the, the um, uh, concept of staggering the, the development? Because it seems like a lot of people want to come in and make a bunch, make big money, do it all at once sell off the lots and kind of hope they can keep going um, by, I forgot the term, Josh and I, we talked about it er, sometime in the recent past, staggering, what was it? Phasing, Phasing it in. Is that, is that a concept that the planning board ought to be looking at to kind of, for these high elevation ones, or, or do you think we have enough in place? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I think people have a right to build, I just don't know they have a right to build unsafely or in things that we end up having to deal with on the back end? If phasing usually comes about when it's a large subdivision. Uh, you know, on a 
28 lot subdivision, even though this has obviously been phased. When you go up, you can tell there was once a cul-de-sac here and now there's a road going through it and then there's another cul-de-sac and there's another road going through it. But usually, you know, when you come into approval process for 28 lots, 30 lots, it's usually, okay, an approval and, and to go on. Phasing and required phasing, I mean, we could look at that, but I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure that that making the developer say, okay, you got to wait two years for every, you know, every X number of lots is going to really make any difference on anything. I mean, I think that what we look at as far as changes in the ordinance is how things, how things come about, how they evolve, and what kind of development we're seeing and what kind of problems we're seeing from that development. Well, it, I mean, our problem is not much different than what they have on the coast. I mean, we have the mountains, they have the coast. Exactly. You know, you got low rates, and people are building bigger houses, and then, you know, I guess they're building what they think they can afford, but it's bigger homes on the shores and at the mountains. And it's just something we have to stay on all the time. I don't, you know, unless, unless people's attitudes change towards housing or rates go up, you know, we're still going to be dealing with big houses on the side of the mountains. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's why we went to say, okay, you want a big house or any house on a steep slope. you got to have a bigger lot. And you can't, you got to watch your disturbance. And you got to watch how much of a, if it's a big roof of the big driveway, then you got to have a big lot. You know, well, that, that's the bottom Craig, line. And it goes, I live in a subdivision that's got 42 lots. And three quarters of them are steep slope. Uh, there's put in, I moved there 24 years ago. There's some up on the hill as you go up the road, and there's some off the side of the hill as you go up the road. The only problem we had was years ago that they were cutting in for a double wide park above us. <clears throat> and we had a lot of the, the mud come and fill the lake up. Well, the county finally settled that. But we, what we're talking about is a lot that was field dirt. Now that, that, this, that we're talking about. That was a field dirt lot. That wasn't a solid lot of, of dirt. There's obviously been a lot of material moved around on that lot. I, I would agree with there's a lot of material been moved around. So what I'm saying is you can every time something happens we'll change more rules and we'll put more people to work engineering and telling people what they need to do when there's a lot of people that know what they ought to be doing to start with. You know, we, we we put out building permits. We ought to be able to, to watch what the people are doing in areas. Steep slope, there's there's places in my development that's above 30. There's probably places in my development that's above 40. And we have had no problems to run off. The, the whole package of the development uh, hasn't given, I mean, I love the, you know, been there 24 years, so I can't, and I live at the foot. I don't live at the top. And, uh, but... Let's, let's look at it what it is. There's a bad builder. They come in here and he took a bunch of dirt and throwed it on somebody's property, packed it, and didn't do a very good job of it, and they build a house. That's, that's pretty simple. When you use field dirt, that's, that's what happens. And so that's, that's the areas that we've got to watch more than on most of these hillsides you find rock pretty quick. You know, even the house that I've got, they found rock where they put the basement and they're down front of my house. Now, they're in a, uh, an area that uh, for showing. So I, I'm not for overdoing these rules. I mean, we're, we're, we're stepping out of the, the total picture. I understand the people have a problem. I understand that if I had the problem in our neighborhood, which we do, we got a homeowner association, that we go after the party that does it. And we had come to the county originally on the, filling the, the lake up with the mud. And, you know, they, we got that cured, got together, and, and got that problem cured. But let's just don't overrule ourselves here, okay? I mean, let's go after who did this. Let's, you know, goes back to the same thing. Josh was talking there a little bit earlier, you know, if we're going to put satellite dishes in, there's going to be some money set aside over here in case there's a problem that, that it can be handled. That ought to be put into the subdivision rules of, of the subdivision. And, uh, but... Um, I'm not for stepping up with a whole lot more rules. You know, I don't think we ought to be fixing anything up there because we didn't do it. I understand. 
I guess at this point I'd let the county attorney talk, uh, you know, about about our obligations as far as the subdivision and this problem. Either way, it's fine. Yeah. All right, I'm fine. I got all my uh, my uh, books and other materials here. So, so the issue is uh, that's been uh, presented to me, and and I've uh, spent some time looking into uh, and uh, meeting with the county uh, staff that's been uh, involved with this. Is uh, what is the authority and and or obligation of the commission? To, uh, to do anything further out at this particular subdivision. And uh, just to make it, uh, to, to, uh, to state what my opinion is, and then I'll explain it, I don't think you either have the obligation or the authority to do anything further. And um, the reason is the, uh, uh, the uh, demolition of this house uh, was done under the uh, unsafe building ordinance of the county. And so uh, it was addressing the unsafety of the particular building. Now the building uh, has been demolished. So the unsafe uh, condition um, that the county building inspector found uh, has been removed. Prior to this demolition, which was done by a qualified demolition company, uh, uh, D.W. Griffin, um, they, the uh, uh, the staff of the county and the demolishing company met with the uh, the soils engineer and they explained what they were going to do. And he said that sounds uh, good to him. So this was uh, was checked out. So now that the unsafe condition has been removed, under what authority might you do something further? Because basically the issue now is now we have this big mountain there. And there's a lower part of the mountain called the toe that you heard him uh, uh, talking about. And uh, uh, strangely enough, in my legal practice, I've actually encountered that term quite a bit. I don't know if you uh, you followed the uh, the mountain air uh, case with the uh, the condominiums where they built condominiums on the side of a mountain, and then uh, they cut the uh, the toe of the mountain underneath that, and all of them started to slide down the hill. And they had to build a six million dollar underground concrete uh, structure that is was like. If you're interested in the subject, uh, I should get that for you because it was amazing what they had to build. It's like one of uh, the pyramids or something. <laughs> I mean, honestly. And and so so uh, after we remove the uh, the demolition the uh, the demolished house, which we only did because our uh, uh, our staff found that there was an unsafe uh, condition which was a uh, dangerous to life, health, or property. Okay, so it was like an emergency. And the, uh, the property owner was ordered to, uh, 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 to do this work because it's the property owner's uh, responsibility. In this case, they didn't have enough money to do it. So uh, either the county had to uh, take care of it in order to protect safety or else just let the condition continue to exist because this lady did not have enough money to do it. The, but the basic uh, uh, principle is that even if the county does it, it's still the property owner's obligation to, to uh, pay back the county for the work. And we have the right to file a lien on the property in order to collect uh, back the, uh, the uh, expense. However, in this case, the, uh, the decision was made and uh, uh, probably was a good decision not to file a lien because to enforce a lien, you end up acquiring title to the property. <laughs> I would say that might constitute jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. So uh, I think basically that the county is going to end up eating this expense. Now here comes the next phase of it, um, and the, uh, the, uh, the subdivision owners uh, come to the county, and uh, I've been here for the last several meetings when they've been here asking, asking you to 
basically fix uh, this mountain according to the soils engineer report, which was prepared before the house was actually demolished, by the way. So I think in order to do that, um, you have to be, uh, somebody has to determine that this mountain is a public health nuisance under GS 153A-140. Uh, and uh, there's two things about that. One is, if it's really a, uh, 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 an emergency situation, it may be necessary to evacuate the homes on this mountain. So uh, it may be necessary to call in the emergency management uh, team, uh, to, uh, you know, like the county did, uh, I think, several years ago in a, uh, a subdivision that was right below this, uh, this dam that was just about to, uh, to fail which would have been catastrophic for the homeowners below the dam. But in the absence of that type of an emergency, I don't think that the county has authority to act uh, further because just taking you back to the beginning of what I uh, said, this was done under the unsafe buildings code. So the buildings uh, gone and that part of it's done. Now we're on onto an unsafe mountain condition, and, but uh, even if you do determine that, and even if you do evacuate everybody and you pay to have this mountain remediated, uh, under this statute, uh, the property owners still have to pay back the county. So I don't, I mean, I don't even think, uh, you know, that unless the, uh, the commission or the staff determines that it's an emergency uh, danger to life, health, uh, safety, imminent uh, danger, that uh, you have the authority uh, to act even if you wanted to. It's very well explained. Yeah, very well explained. Any, any questions or comments? Our sympathies are certainly with the people of Black Oak, but we wanted to look at the, I, I, want, I think this commission wanted two things to, to come out here. One. We want to make sure that people understand we've tried to put safeguards. This, this thing, this is an old subdivision. We want some safeguards so it won't happen again. And secondly, unfortunately, we can't do anything to help. Uh, we did take the building down. We did, we did that. And I think the, Mr. Deutsch has done a wonderful job explaining the, what we have. So um, that's, that's what I wanted to, to get across. And I know the, Black Oak folks have been here a lot, and, and again, <clears throat> we're very, very much, um, we're sorry we didn't do it 20 years ago, but it didn't happen, so we have to move on. Any other comments about this? We've heard plenty. Okay. Let's go on then. We are on a new business, addition of income maintenance case workers, Jim Holland. <clears throat> Mr. Holland, good to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Appreciate the opportunity to be before you today to present a request for additional income maintenance caseworkers within Health and Human Services and specifically within the Department of Social Services, the Public Assistance Division, who determines eligibility for Medicaid primarily and for the Food Assistance Program. As you know, the uh, County Department of Social Services administers in each 100 counties, the County Department of Social Services administers the laws and policies of state and federal government re related, in this case, to public assistance administration. The federal government establishes the programs, the state establishes the rules and regulations under the federal guidance, and then it's the responsibility of each county department of social services to administer that program based on those rules and regulations. We follow those to, in order to make sure that the citizens in our county receive the benefits that they're entitled to and that they apply for in a timely manner. And then we also do that to assure that the benefits that they receive are determined, that eligibility is determined properly so that we make sure that we remain in compliance with those rules and responsibilities because ultimately that liability rests with us in the county. So today, what we're talking about in the presentation is to talk to you about some changes, transformational changes that are happening within the department and within specifically the state of North Carolina. As you know, 
North Carolina is beginning as implementing the North Carolina FAST or North Carolina Families Accessing Services Through Technology. This is a transformational program within North Carolina that allows people to access benefits in a completely different manner than they have before and to apply for those benefits differently. The state implemented and developed this program to increase the efficiency of the program, to allow us to also be more effective in the delivery of the benefits to the citizens, and also to provide mechanisms for us to maintain the integrity of the program to assure that only those people that are eligible for the program receive the benefits for the program. <coughs> the goal is to make sure that the lives of the citizens of this state are better and have a better outcome. North Carolina NCFAST was also implemented as a result of changes in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Specifically, the Affordable Care Act requires that we in the North Carolina provide an access point for the citizens to be able to apply both for the Affordable Care Act in the federal marketplace as well as for public assistance benefits. The, one of the ways that they did that in NCFAST was to try to streamline the application process and the eligibility determination process. If you look at the slide, you'll see on the left hand side of the slide represents the graph of the way we used to determine eligibility determination. We had, in this case, four different programs with three different eligibility systems. So if someone applied for food assistance, we looked at the food assistance program and they saw a food assistance program person, income maintenance caseworker. If they went to Medicaid, they saw a different person to apply for Medicaid with different eligibility rules. In the NC Fast world, that takes those programs and puts them together and uses the NC Fast program to determine eligibility with one system, NC Fast. We have currently beforehand, we had legacy systems that didn't do a very good job of talking to each other or sharing information. So we were having to go between multiple systems. NC Fast uses one system that determines eligibility with the different programs. How that benefits our citizens is somewhat obvious in that they have multiple ways to access the, the benefits to uh, whether it's online or whether it's in our offices or out in the community. They only have to tell the information to us one time in one way versus multiple different ways that they had done that before. It provides a way to get more accurate reporting and a way to have a, a better link, which is one of the requirements that caused North Carolina to move more quickly with the implementation of the Medicaid portion of NCFAST to allow us to be in compliance with the Affordable Care Act. And in the Affordable Care Act, we had to have, North Carolina had to have a way to communicate between the federal marketplace. So when someone went to the marketplace to apply for benefits, they're required to be screened or that system screens them and says you may be potentially eligible for Medicaid. We're going to send your application to North Carolina to let the County Department of Social Services make that determination. Likewise, if someone comes into the Department of Social Services and applies for Medicaid and it, they're not eligible, then we have the ability to send that application to the federal marketplace to have them screened at the federal level for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. That's been a significant, that's, that represents some significant challenges, as you've heard over the last several months, to be able to do that. As I talked about, it's a tr transformational change, and it's not something that's caught us as a county unaware, thanks to a lot of planning and thanks to a lot of support through you to allow us to be able to plan and implement a system that helps meet the challenges that are before us. If we look at this timeline, and won't go over all of the details there, we started back in 2010 to look at how we made sure that we were positioned to provide benefits in the most effective manner possible, as well as an efficient manner. We wanted to be effective so that we could get people their benefits timely, and we wanted to be effective so that we could make sure that we determined eligibility correctly. That's a very critical component as you go forward because if we determine eligibility incorrectly, it comes back to us. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that we don't 
do that incorrectly. And also we want to make sure that people get their benefits timely. Mm -hmm. People that come to us are coming to us often in a crisis and it's very important that we have the staff necessary and the staff trained and the equipment and the technology necessary so that we can make that determination easily and quickly and accurately. As with any system, there are challenges that are before us in order for us to be successful. The first one that you see there is in CFAST, the very system that's before us that's making the transformational change that allows us to determine eligibility for all programs is also a challenge. I'm sure you've heard about m many of the challenges, challenges that the, states, <laughs> the state has faced and that the counties have faced in terms of implementing in CFAST. We've worked with the state very closely and the state has worked with us very closely to make that uh, transition as painless as possible both for our own staff but also for the citizens that we serve because we wanted to make sure that they got their benefits timely. With NCFAST and because of the Affordable Care Act we're also required to collect many more data elements than we previously had before. That is also to allow us to determine eligibility at the, or for the federal government to determine eligibility at their level, but also for us as in a paperless system, in an eligibility system that is, in this case, statewide, that that information sits in one repository rather than in a file room in some local Department of Social Services that makes it difficult to get to. So that requires a significant amount of time to do that. There's also the issue of policy knowledge and complexity. While NCFAST makes sure that eligibility is, rests in one system, the policies have not kept up with the technology at the federal level. So there are often very different policy constraints for each particular program. And it requires significant knowledge on the part of our staff to make sure that we keep all of that knowledge in our heads and that we know how to access that information to make sure that we determine eligibility correctly and also that we tell the consumers that we're providing those services for why or why not they are not eligible for those services. One of the other things that has happened in, in addition to the ACA coordination has been that there have been some significant changes related to income. That's another example of how different policies and different programs have different guidelines that must be met and so in us meeting that process we've had to comply with a federal requirement for the way the federal government will look at income for calculating benefits under the Affordable Care Act and simply the growth in Medicaid both for as you'll see in this slide the growth in Medicaid for people that are applying new and uh, new people become eligible for the program and also because of the Affordable Care Act there's a effect called the woodwork effect that the federal government has said that as a result of more people applying for health care benefits through the Affordable Care Act, there will be more people that are not el actually eligible under the Affordable Care Act, but they're eligible under Medicaid. So we are seeing already an increase in the number of Medicaid eligibles simply because they're wanting to apply for health care benefits under the Affordable Care Act. So the meat of the proposal that we're asking you to consider today. We're asking you to consider increasing by 12 the number of income maintenance caseworkers to determine eligibility. When we do this, we're keeping in mind that because this is a transformational change, we know that the type of employee that needs to do this must be a technically savvy employee and must be able to do, handle multiple tasks at the same time. And they also must have strong customer service skills because these are very complicated programs that people that are applying for need to understand how to access them and what are the issues related to their eligibility. In addition to asking for the 12 income maintenance caseworkers to help determine eligibility, we also know that we must have additional supervisors to help supervise that staff as well as to also help meet the staffing ratios, reduce the worker to supervisor ratio. That's important for several reasons. One of the main reasons for, is important is to make sure that we're compliant with policy and that we have the proper supervision and training of our staff to make sure that they determine eligibility appropriately and that they serve the staff appropriately as well. There's also a tremendous amount of data that comes through this with NCFAST. We're adding a whole lot of data in, but we have the ability to get a lot of data out. In Health and Human Services, 
we think that we, with your support, have done a very good job of managing on data and making decisions based on objective data that comes out and making decisions that make us more effective in the delivery of our services. And having the proper supervisor to worker ratio will continue to help us to do that and to uh, better support our staff and our citizens. But there are other options and uh, these options that we have considered and we present these to you both as things that we have considered but ones that we hope we would not have to put into place. Those options would be we could maintain the current staffing that we have now. <coughs> right now in, in trying to make sure that we had the right <coughs> proposal to bring before you, we implemented a hiring of some temporary staff in order to see is this the right program, is this the right mix in order for us to do this. We believe that it is. Keeping temporary staff for the long term, however, is inefficient from several standpoints in that it means that we'll have to continually look to hire because those temporary staff will want to move into uh, regular positions that we have as they come open and they'll also look for employment outside of the, uh, the county. As well as we must make sure that we have uh, increased training as a result of that. The more turnover, the more training, the more time, the more time that we are not able to spend helping citizens access those services. Uh, if we keep the current staff or do not keep the temporary staff that we have or not get the additional staff, there's a very strong likelihood with the increase in the amount of work as well as the increase in just the sheer numbers of people that are being receiving our benefits that the time that it takes for us to deliver benefits will increase. We've uh, done an excellent job at making sure that we determine benefits well within the state and federal time standards. As we go forward and we have more information to enter and we have more people to serve, it's very likely that those time standards will not be able to be maintained. The consequence of that uh, for citizens, it's a delay in receiving their benefits. We've already seen the delay as it relates to the implementation of NCFAST and we've had to take some very significant measures to make sure that the people receiving our benefits did not have those delays such as working with partners in the community such as providing food vouchers in the community because again most people that come into our agency are in a crisis situation. There are federal and state compliance requirements that unfortunately they don't bend, they bend us and if we don't meet those requirements there are penalties that we will pay and because we are a county administered system the state will look to us to make those penalties payments. Finally we looked at other staffing solutions if as you know we are very much in favor of looking to see who is the best organization or entity to provide the services that we offer and if we can look to an outside organization to provide those services as good or better than we could have, we are very much interested in those partnerships. In this case, under the eligibility determination, the federal government has said to North Carolina that only government merited employees can determine eligibility for public assistance programs. That means we cannot contract that service out. That means we cannot have temporary employees doing that on a long-term basis. So we must use government merited employees to determine that eligibility. And in that, in that, that helps to us to continue our focus on core. Within all of Health and Human Services, we make sure that what we're doing is focusing on the core responsibilities that we have as responsibility under law, policy, statute, or commission directive. And we take that very seriously. So the cost for this proposal for the remainder of this fiscal year is $427,452. Of that total cost, the federal government reimburses counties 50% of that. So the net county impact for that is $213,726. I want to just wind this presentation up by thanking you for the support that you've given us over the years. All the things that you saw in that timeline have been a result of your commitment to us to be and to the citizens of this county to be able to provide benefits accurately, timely, effectively and efficiently and we thank you for that. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions Mr. Holland? I just have a, a comment one um, 
I can't commend you and your department enough. We've had, you and I have worked together on different issues and your work is extraordinary. And my comment about this is uh, we're dealing with folks who don't ask to be there, who don't, you know, the first thing they wake up in the morning and say, I'm gonna rush and get some assistance. These are the most vulnerable, vulnerable. And to us, it's incumbent to do whatever we need to do to make sure their lives are a little bit better with what we can provide. I, I do have a, uh, uh, I also want to echo some of uh, Commissioner Frost's comments, but y'all do a fantastic job. It's amazing dealing with everything that comes from, the, you know, outside of our, our county as far as influence and trying to work within all that and, and it's been a difficult year in doing that. But um, how do you come up with the pay? Um, so there's 17 positions, $430,000, uh, you know, approximately. And uh, that's for, I guess, about five, well, is it five months, six months? It's for uh, five months. So February how do y'all determine that? I understand you had some other factors that went in as far as turnover. You know, you don't want to use a lot of temps and things for things. And, 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 and I, I agree with that. I think that's a good idea. But how do you arrive at that? Is that, is that determined in department or is that determined by state, federal? guidelines uh, the Department of Social Services and Public Health are under the Office of State Personnel which requires us to submit job descriptions based on the work that they do we do that in yearly and submit a County Human Resources submits that plan to the State Office of State Personnel for their approval we have very strict guidelines as to the types of employees that can do those uh, particular positions. And they have to meet those qualifications in order to do that. That salary and pay uh, plan uh, is, is adopted at uh, yearly and is submitted to the Office of State Personnel for their consent and approval. Uh, also, is that a f full package including all benefits or is that just, a, is that just pay? No, sir, that's the, um, that's the complete package okay, of so salary that, and that, benefits. That, that, that makes a big difference when I'm when I was doing the math on how much it was per, per person. So that includes total benefit package, everything. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. John, what do we do uh, as these people hopefully can go back to work? Um, I noticed the food stamps were, were way up on that, and now we got the federal government mandating us again to do something that uh, it's going to cost county taxpayers, and it's not – it's not part of our budget, it's something that's going to have to come out of the fund balance. want to help people, but do we back off or do we just keep climbing as, as the process goes along? If, if Medicare, Medicaid goes down, people get jobs uh, and have, can go get insurance or, or whatever and f not have to have food stamps. Do we bring the county employees? Do we back it up, or do we do we try to stay where we're at? And from what I understand, this NC uh, PAC deal has pretty well been a disaster to put together, and your people have done a fantastic job to get it to work so far. Uh, but I'm I'm just looking at you know we're we're we the federal government has the big arm, and the state has the other big arm, but I don't see any state money tied into uh, this going on at close to half a million dollars. I see part, you know, part of it from the feds, but I don't see anything from the state. You know, what, what, what can we do to try to help in that area to bend their arm a little bit to, to help us? Well, you're correct in that the state does not pay any, does not share in any of the costs for the staffing. Uh, they do provide funding for other programs. Uh, block, mostly block grant funding that they provide for implementation of other programs. But the responsibility, since we are a county administered system in North Carolina, rests between the federal government and the county for that cost. Uh, the idea about if more people go back to work, uh, what happens? Uh, we certainly continue to evaluate uh, our staffing and we would make sure that our staffing, that we were not overstaffed. Uh, we we believe that we're uh, very lean and very efficient in the way that we deliver those services. Uh, as as you know too, uh, 
most of the, the recipients for both Medicaid and food actually do work. And for the, in the Medicaid world, a lot of those are children and a lot of those are uh, people that are disabled or the people that are 65 and over. So we do mind very carefully to make sure that if, we, if the roles go down because the economy picks up and people no longer need our assistance, and that's, our, that's a, a great goal for us, and we want to encourage self-sufficiency as well, that we would look to uh, reallocate those resources or not use those resources. Mm -hmm. And we do evaluate that every year during the budget. We watch those numbers. The data is very, very important. I would point out that there was a time a few years ago that the counties had to pay a portion of the Medicaid claims expense. It was the fastest growing line in our county budget. We made a trade on that um, for a sales tax a few years ago, and it's the best trade we've ever made, and we guard that trade diligently. Uh, we don't want the, the state to give us that expense back. But if you look at the state budget, it's Medicaid claims expense that just really eat their budget alive. So um, while the administrative costs are very steep, they, are, they don't approach what we were uh, experiencing in Medicaid claims. Okay, thank you. I, I think what, what we do, uh, we're hearing a lot about federal, state, but as a county, I think we rise to, the, to meet the challenge, and that's what we're doing. And it's my understanding, like with uh, NC Fast, uh, which hopefully, like any new programming, it's got problems. But I understand what used to take 15 minutes to put in the system now is about an hour and 15 minutes. So I, I understand where some of this is coming from. And uh, regardless of what you, you may or may not think about, you know, the Affordable Care and NC Fast. Uh, I think our job is simply to meet the challenges uh, that the state has put forth and that the uh, federal government's put forth. And so, thank you. Thank you. I have to brag just a moment because Jim's not going to. Uh, <laughs> while we de definitely measure uh, caseload a little different than we used to, you'll remember a few months back, we brought you some information that the average caseload in the state is 272 cases per worker. We're at, uh, we're at 500. Wow. We continue yeah. to maintain that kind of average uh, uh, in, this, in the state, and while we struggle ourselves with how do we get better and better at what we do, we are looked to, uh, human services look to as a leader in the state for North Carolina, and we're always, you know, brought into discussions about how we do it better. They do a really good job. They struggled with bringing this recommendation to you and this request, uh, and then they have really scrubbed it and vetted it to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments or questions? Now, is there a motion to adopt the uh, resolution? Make I'll a make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. It's been a motion by Vice Chair Frost, second by Commissioner Belcher to adopt the uh, um, proposal to add income maintenance caseworkers. Is there any other comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Then we have adopted the. Uh, additional case workers by a seven to oh vote in the budget amendment thank you thank Jim. you Mr. thanks Chairman for all your work that's a fast moving target there uh, next we have uh, Donna Clark is going to talk to us about the resolution making uh, findings about a contract amendment and uh, deeds of trust and all kind of things all kinds Ms. of Clark's things <laughs> thank you Mr. Chairman members of the board actually we're not requesting any action from you today all we request is that you uh, set the public hearing for your continued meeting on January 14th at which time we will talk about all of these documents as well as the budget amendments and each of the projects that uh, that we are planning on financing in this next issuance of bonds so unless you have any questions I just ask that you call the public hearing on January 14th at 530 in this room all right any questions is there a motion to adopt the public hearing at January 14th at 530 at this facility so moved. A motion by Commissioner King. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> second. second, Commissioner Fryer, excuse me. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of setting a public hearing on this resolution January 14 at 5 o'clock, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Then we will, con we will continue this meeting to go straight into that meeting. Is that the plan? 
Okay, thank you, Ms. Thank Clark. you. Next, we have board appointments. I think by consensus, the board elected to uh, interview the Economic Development Coalition um, applicants, and we will do that as it's scheduled. Uh, next, we have a board of adjustment. We have four reappointments and two vacancies. Uh, I would suggest that we take this up on in three votes, one for the reappointments, one for the next seat, and one for the last seat, if that's agreeable with yes. everyone. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion to uh, reappoint the individuals uh, listed? So moved. So we'll just read them into the record. There's been a motion by Vice Chair Frost, a second by Fire. Commissioner King or Fryer? Fryer. Fryer. Commissioner Fryer. Um, would you read those into the record, Commissioner Frost? David Semi, Roberta Taylor, uh, Michael Bacote, and Lisa Stevens. All righty. Um, is there any discussion or any additions to those uh, names for the reappointment vote? If not, all those in favor of appointing Mr. Summy, Ms. Taylor, Mr. Bacote, and Ms. Stevens for reappointment say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Then we will re reappoint those individuals by a 7-0 vote. Is there a nomination for the next chair or the next seat in the Board of Adjustment? Chair again, I would uh, nominate uh, Mr. Lloyd Friel. Okay. I'd like to nominate Tom Christ. Okay, Mr. Christ, Mr. Friel. Any other nominations? Uh, and we'll vote on, the, let's see, let me think the best way to do this. Um, Did I do that right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I'd like to nominate Stephanie Gosnell. Okay. Um, no, I think we're messing up. Yeah, we're yeah getting, I think we're, we are. We're getting ready, we're getting ready to cause a, a confusion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's, well, we, we could do it this way. There's been a nomination for Mr. Friel. Um, do we want to vote on the individu individually? I think that's what we said we were going to do. So um, all those in favor of Mr. Friel say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, Ms. Gosnell, all in favor of Stephanie Gosnell, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That is a 7-0 vote. She is appointed. All those in favor of Mr. Christ, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That is a 7-0 appointment. So we have appointed Mr. Gosnell and Mr. Christ to that board. Ms. Gosnell. Ms. Gosnell. <laughs> Ms. Gosnell. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Ch Chairman Gann, um just as, I, I don't know. Can we just? I mean, we're, this is settled. I'm, I'm good with that. With that. But I just going forward, I don't know. I just uh, I kind of feel uncomfortable voting against people who like are just citizens applying for these boards. I just as a future process thing, could we? I'd just like to maybe talk about that. Some yes, more. sir. Absolutely. I just, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. I mean, ultimately, it is about we yeah. do have to vote to appoint these people, and that is what it is. But I, I don't know. I find it a little uncomfortable to actually vote against people in this process so I, I don't know if there's a way around that I'm not trying to no I no just, I, I think just, it's a legitimate request you know we have done it both ways we did vote in block and I think there were some issues um, <coughs> we, sh we should have left it just two per block okay thank you uh, I think we determined in pre-session there was no smart start or juvenile crime uh, prevention candidate that we could Do use we will time. take that up um, and I, th I would ask, I think the board by consensus agreed to make an appointment to the PAC Place Board. Um, Carol Peterson's name has been uh, placed in nomination. Uh, is there a uh, motion to appoint former Commissioner Peterson to that board? So moved. There's been a motion to appoint Commissioner, former Commissioner Peterson by Vice Chair Frost. Um, is there, are there any other nominations? I don't think we have any other applications, so they would not be people that have applied for the job. So, okay. If not, then uh, all those in favor of what, what, appointing. We need to second. second it. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner King, second. Uh, any discussion or any other candidates for that uh, board? If not, all those in favor of appointing former Commissioner Peterson to the PAC Place Board say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That is also a 7-0 vote. Uh, we, let me do the announcements and then I think we have some closed session um, uh, matters. We will not be taking any action after our closed session and we will come back to continue this case, uh, excuse me, this, uh, this uh, yes, the case of the commissioners. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll call the jury maybe. No, who knows? Uh, no, we will continue this meeting to uh, next week, January 14 at 530. Um, the meeting will be in room 326 at 200 College Street in downtown Asheville. Our commission will hold a retreat on January 28th, beginning at 3 o'clock in the first floor conference room at 200 College Street in downtown Asheville. Our second regular meeting for January 21st has been canceled. The next regular meeting will be February 4, beginning at 4.30, room 326 at 200 College Street in downtown Asheville. The county offices will be closed, all county offices will be closed, Martin Luther King holiday, Monday, January 20th. Our thoughts and prayers are with Mandy Stone and her family on the loss of her mother. We would ask that all of uh, uh, the uh, Buncombe County hold them in your thoughts and prayers. And commission meetings can be seen on BC Charter Cable Channel 192, ATT UVerse Channel 99, live on BC TV uh, Channel 192, and on BuncombeCounty.org during the meetings or online anytime at BuncombeCounty.org. Um, any other matters before the court, before uh, before the commission, before we go into? Uh, I'm going to be a judge one day. Maybe I have a <laughs> secret to desire to be a judge to, on this. Um, any, any other matters that any commissioner has before we go into closed session? And when we come back, again, we will continue this hearing, this, this case, this commission meeting to um, the 14th. Thank you. Sounds good. Okay, well, is there a motion to go into closed session? Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner, Vice Chair Frost, Commissioner King, all those in favor of going to closed session, say aye. 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 We are in closed session. Yay. You're going to be a judge. You're going to be a court judge. <laughs>